so as, as Becky alluded to, there are obviously many potential concerns related to manure irrigation. Uh, and, and one of them is this idea of pathogen uh, drift, the concern that pathogens in the manure could, could be blown downwind during application and, and cause infections or illnesses and in people exposed to them downwind. So that was one of the bigger concerns when the work group was meeting, and it's also one of the ones where there's kind of the least scientific information. So we, we conducted this study um, kind of parallel to the work group where we, uh, where we investigated the risk related to that pathogen drift problem. And uh, it's a very large study with a huge field component involved a lot of people. So that's, that's all the names that you see here on the screen. Uh, I'm going to try to explain a couple things in the title first. Uh, I'll start with risk and then I'll also explain what quantitative microbial risk assessment is. So just to define what I mean when I say risk, I usually mean something fairly specific and quantitative when I'm talking about risk. Uh, and I like to think of this, or the, w the way it's relevant here is to think of it as cases of illness for people exposed. So um, I've got you know this little illustration here where if we have 10, 10 people that we expose to manure irrigation, um, the little red stick figures there might be two people that get sick, and in this case, the, the risk then would be two illnesses per people exposed. You can also interpret that as a probability of 20%. There's a 20% chance that you would become ill after being exposed to manure irrigation. So that's the kind of number that we're trying to estimate when, we, when we're talking about this. And what quantitative microbial risk assessment is then is a way to predict uh, that risk to predict how many cases of illness we would find in an exposed population using mathematical models. And the prediction is based on the average pathogen dose that someone ingests. The alternative, just to put it in context, is epidemiology, which measures risk directly. So if you were going to do an epi study of manure irrigation uh, related to pathogen drift, you would have to go find 10 people that were exposed and then you, you interview them and you ask them this whole set of questions to find how, how many became ill after exposure and how many of those could be attributed to the, to the manure irrigation. The problem with epidemiology is it's very expensive, um, probably about 10 times as expensive as QMRA. So that's why we're using QMRA in this, in this study. Nobody's ever done epi for manure irrigation because the practice is so new and epi is so expensive. People have used QMRA, um, microbial risk assessment for manure irrigation. And this is just a, an illustration of previous results. So what you have on the y-axis here is probability of infection. And on the x-axis, this is distance downwind and feet. Uh, to give you a reference point, there's um, a risk equals one times 10 to the minus four. This is one case of illness per 10,000 people exposed. And a reference distance, this is 500 feet. This is a fairly um, a common distance that was, that was discussed as kind of a reference point by the, by the work group. So there's been a handful of studies, seven of them, that have looked at risk related to distance for manure irrigation. And the main point here is that these results are basically kind of all over the place. So way down here, uh, this is the, the lowest number in the data set. This is less than 10 to the minus 12, so this is, this is less than one illness per, I gotta think about this for a second, trillion people exposed. And at the same distance, we have another study that's, that's predicting 100% risk of illness. So everyone that gets exposed will become ill. So taken together, these previous studies are not very conclusive, they, they present very um, uncertain and variable results. And the common theme with all of these studies uh, really is that none of them are based on field data. So if you remember, I said that QMRA uses an average dose to predict risk. Um, none of these are measuring the concentrations that you use to calculate that dose. They're all predicting the dose or predicting that concentration based on more mathematical models. So QMRA is already a modeling approach and we're kind of doing modeling on top of modeling and there's um, kind of the number one rule of modeling is that 
if your inputs are no good, your output's no good. So there's just a lot of uncertainty about what the inputs are here. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the output with previous studies. So our objectives then were to identify the risk of illness from airborne pathogens during manure irrigation, uh, downwind of the irrigation area, uh, very specifically based on measuring concentrations of microbes in the air. That's something that nobody's ever done, and we we're hoping that that would reduce the uncertainty in our results compared to those previous studies. The risk of illness that we're looking at specifically is acute gastrointestinal illness. So this is some form of illness involving uh, vomiting or diarrhea. Uh, this is something you would get from E. coli or Campylobacter or Salmonella. It, it covers all of those. And we want to relate that risk to distance. The other thing we want to do is to identify the other variables other than distance that are important for airborne pathogen transport. So this can be things like wind speed, um, the amount of sunshine, the relative humidity, uh, the temperature, because if any of those things affect how many pathogens make it downwind, then those are all potentially useful when designing best management practices. So here's a little conceptual model. Um, so to begin, if we have irrigation, I just want to point out too that first of all, when we're irrigating with manure irrigation, the majority of the material that comes out of the system ends up on the ground the way it's designed to. Uh, and that's that area, that application area, we call that the wetted perimeter. So everything that goes into the wetted perimeter, that's landing where it's supposed to. But if the wind is blowing, some small fraction of that material gets blown away from the wetted perimeter in the form of aerosols or droplets. And eventually, makes it downwind to people, uh, re receptors or potential hosts that could then ingest the pathogens in those aerosols and droplets and become sick. Um, there's a couple different exposure routes that we that are potentially important. One would be inhalation. So you, you, uh, you actually swallow a small amount of the material that you inhale out of the air. So that's, that's the, uh, the exposure route there. We can also have fomite deposition. So that would be, excuse me, <clears throat> that would be pathogens being deposited on solid surfaces and then people touch the surfaces and touch their mouths and they ingest things that way. We can have deposition on food. We can also have vectors. If the dog gets sick, it can pass an illness on, on to uh, someone that comes in contact with it. Excuse me. The exposure route that we looked at specifically, we didn't look at all of these. We just looked at inhalation because that's the most uh, direct um, and so we thought if we found the highest risk with that most direct exposure route, then maybe we can look at the others. And if the risk was fairly low, uh, then maybe we wouldn't worry so much about the others. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that while transport is happening, while the aerosols and droplets are flying through the air, microbial in inactivation is taking place. So bacteria are sensitive to UV light, to relative humidity, to temperature, and they'll actually die in the air while they're being blown downwind. So um, it's a fairly complex process. We have a, a large source, but we also have this kind of inactivation term, and, and then you're, you're not exposed to everything necessarily that's in the air. Our research approach had three kind of components to it. Uh, this included collecting a large amount of field data, and, and as I've mentioned once or twice already, this is the really kind of novel part of our study compared to the previous ones, is we had a huge amount of field data. Um, we then modeled that field data uh, to achieve the, the two objectives I talked about, and then part of the modeling was also used in the risk assessment. So these models help us predict um, pathogen concentrations, which we can then use to predict dose and feed into the risk assessment. So for the field data, uh, we had 25 field trials, and these field trials are fairly involved events. Every field trial is um, you know, probably a minimum of four hours. If everything goes perfectly and uh, we have kind of all hands on deck and um, probably late in the season when we're all, we're all very experienced with it. Uh, a lot of these field trials are all kind of all day events. Uh, 15 of the field trials involve um, traveling guns, eight involve center pivot. We also did two extra field trials measuring concentrations downwind from just conventional tanker application. During each field trial, we measured microbe concentrations in manure, uh, the source manure, and then also at multiple distances downwind. And I'll, I'll describe that a little more in a second. 
Uh, we measured concentrations using two different approaches. There's two main approaches used in environmental microbiology. One is qPCR, um, so that uses the polymerase chain reaction to quantify microbes in the air. The other is conventional culture methods, so you should think of petri dishes with this. And then we also collected weather data for each trial. Um, so yeah, we've, we've collected qPCR and conventional culture methods. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you can see uh, these are our sampling units that we would set up, and um, <clears throat> they, they contained a variety of samplers. They had button samplers on them, which are actually probably too small to see, but those help us collect our qPCR measurements. They're little filters that air gets sucked through, and then you extract DNA off of the filters, and, and you can uh, use that for qPCR. We also use these, uh, these little silver disks here. These are called Anderson samplers. So this is something that a Petri dish sits in. And again, you suck air through it and the uh, particles in the air, which include bacteria, uh, impact on those Petri dishes. And then you can, you can grow them in an incubator overnight and count how many there are. Um, we also use a portable weather station to get all of our, our weather or all of our meteorological conditions. So that included wind direction and speed, air temperature, the amount of solar radiation, which is basically how much sunshine, the amount of relative humidity, uh, and then precipitation was always zero during these trials. We, we never um, conducted field trials while it was raining because it just um, it didn't work with our equipment. So this is a typical configuration for a, for a field trial. Uh, this is kind of looking down on it from, from above. So these arrows indicate the direction that the, that the air is blowing. Um, and then this is this is for a traveling gun, but it would work basically the same way as a center pivot. So this little kind of half disc here is the wetted perimeter for a traveling gun, which then gets pulled um, gets pulled backwards towards the top of the screen. Um, and then we would have an upwind control. So that tells us what background levels of microbes are in the air, and there are actually sometimes background levels that you can that you can measure. Uh, and then we have a series of downwind measurements. And this is, it was not exact for every trial, these exact distances, but these are pretty typical. So from 100 feet to 650 feet, and then normally five different distances. Um, and then at most or all distances, or well, most distances, we collected duplicate measurements um, kind of on each side of a, a center line going through the application area. Um, this is actually a big part of kind of what took a long time with each of these field trials. So during a field trial, you might run the irrigation equipment for an hour or an hour and a half, but it actually took probably two hours a lot of times to set all of this up. There's lots of generators involved and pumps and fans and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so it was hard, you know, we wanted to be able to just run out there and start sampling as soon as the conditions were perfect. But a lot of times you get out there and by the time you were set up, things had changed. So that was a, a struggle that we had to deal with. Just a sample of the weather conditions that we found. Um, so these charts just kind of show that basically the range of conditions, mean temperature anywhere from 40 to just over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity from 30 to 80 percent, mean wind speed anywhere from about two miles an hour to um, about 12 or 13, and then here's some max max wind speed less than five up to 20. So these are these are wind gusts basically, and then mean solar radiance is anywhere from zero to a thousand watts per square meter. These are kind of unusual units. Zero is nighttime, there's, there's no sunshine. So we actually did uh, two or three trials at night um, because we thought that that would affect the amount of microbial inactivation that we saw. And then a thousand is just a, basically a bright, sunny summer day. The point here is that with all of these, we covered a very wide range of conditions and that's good. We feel confident extrapolating our data to um, to a kind of a general set of weather conditions. We weren't real skewed one way or the other in terms of the amount of sunshine or wind or temperature or anything like that. Also, just to give you an idea of, of um, just kind of a, a gut feeling of what the concentrations were that we ran into, this is some Petri dishes in that configuration that I was showing, and this is an upwind control with nothing growing on it. Um, this is a sample of manure. This is 100 microliters of manure. So basically a, a pin drop of manure diluted one to 100 and played it out so that there's a lot growing in the manure. But then just 100 feet from the wetted perimeter, 540 liters of air contains only, only two colony forming units. 
right? And then as you go further downwind, you get less and less. There's, there's basically none in most of these. So that's just to give you an idea, even though you have a lot of manure coming out of one of these systems, uh, you can actually be just a short distance away and there's, there's really a, a very, very tiny fraction of it that actually is making it downwind. So the modeling was basically just statistical modeling and we had two objectives here. One was to predict air concentrations and those get used uh, directly in the risk assessment. So we're just trying to reproduce the data essentially with that objective. The other objective is to relate air concentrations to the weather conditions and like I said before, that gives us something we can use to recommend best management practices. When we uh, did that second objective, the most important things that we found other than other than distance were wind speed and the pathogen concentrations in manure. Those are things that make sense. Uh, it's not a big surprise, but it's reassuring that the data um, kind of reinforced that, that, that those are important factors. For risk assessment, as I said, we used uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment. We calculated the average dose from several different variables. One was pathogen prevalence. So the, basically the fraction of farms that have a given pathogen on them at any given time. Uh, to give you an example, um, about 40% of dairy operations in the country have E. coli uh, 0157 on them at any given time. Uh, that's according to USDA data. Um, trying to think of what the other, Salmonella is another one that's about 40%. So those are values of pathogen prevalence. We also calculate average dose from distance from the age of the person that's exposed. Uh, because that controls the rate at which they breathe, their inhalation rate, and the amount of time that they spend outdoors during a typical day. And those were also factors in calculating dose because uh, dose is the product of concentration and the amount of air that you inhale. We also had to use pathogen surrogates because the farms that we used, uh, the pathogens were not very common, so we had to basically estimate their, their transport behavior from bugs that are non-pathogenic. So those two surrogates included bovine bacteroides and gram-negative bacteria. Uh, one's basically very conservative with respect to public health and one is, is, is not. One's more realistic, I suppose. And these are the results that we get. This is, this is risk of, uh, or probability of acute gastrointestinal illness plotted against distance. And there's a, a variety of results here because they represent kind of uncertainty remember we're using a uh, we're taking pathogen measurements in the air but we're also since we're using QMRA ultimately still making predictions using a model and so these four different panels reflect a set of four different um, assumptions related to uncertainties in that model so we can't just give you unfortunately one answer one risk value at any given distance we can only give you a range uh, and, and so these four panels illustrate that range so for each of these, this is probability of acute gastrointestinal illness plotted against um, distance. And I'll use this bottom right one as an example just because the numbers are easy to read. Uh, the 0 0.01, this would be a 1 in 100 chance of becoming ill. Uh, and you can contrast that to this, this top left one here. Uh, this is a 1 in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a 1 in 100,000 chance of becoming ill uh, where my mouse cursor is right here. Okay. So what you see is in all of these, uh, there's a distance effect. All of these have a, this slope going down with distance. That makes sense, and that's based purely, uh, well, not purely, but that's based on our pathogen measurements that we took in those 25 field trials. Um, but depending on the prevalence value that you assume for the pathogens, and we're looking at three different pathogens here, Campylobacter jejuni, E. coli, uh, EHEC, which is E. coli 0157, and Salmonella, Depending on the pathogen prevalence that you use, you get different pathogens being the most important in terms of risk. And then also depending on the surrogate that we use, um, you get kind of different risk levels. So uh, you get lower risk when you're using the gram negative as a surrogate. That's the more realistic surrogate um, where it's basically um, saying that the pathogen dies very quickly with distance. You get higher risk values with the bovine bacteroides surrogate. This is the more conservative surrogate with respect to public health. It says that pathogens die more slowly with distance. Um, that pathogen levels are higher with distance, I guess. And then with typical prevalence levels, so this means that pathogens are present on less than 100% of farms, you get lower risk values. And then if you assume that pathogens are always present, um, which is a very conservative assumption with respect to public health, you get higher risk values. Um, but in general, the risk ranges 
from somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, one in a hundred thousand. So, for instance, this this chart here, the highest value is about two and a half per hundred thousand, and the lowest value is just below one per hundred thousand. So they range from about one in a hundred thousand to maybe one in a hundred. So here, the highest risk value is about three in a hundred, and the lowest um, is quite a bit lower than one in a hundred. And, and again, these are our results, and they're, they're based on the, the 25 field trials that we conducted. To put that in context, this is again the, the previous uh, QMRAs. Um, one in 100,000 is at this line right here, uh, this 10 to the minus 5 line. And one in 100 is all the way up here, 10 to the minus 2. So that's still a very wide range, but it's it's more narrow than than what the previous risk estimates have found. And again, we attribute that largely to the fact that we were able to collect um, field data uh, to base our pathogen doses on. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> the the risk is quite close to acceptable risk benchmarks that are used in other contexts. So there's no acceptable risk benchmark for manure irrigation, but if you look at drinking water. Uh, EPA has an acceptable risk benchmark that is actually this 10 to the minus 4 level, 1 in 10,000. And, and a fairly large number of our risk estimates for manure irrigation are actually below this line. Uh, there's also a risk benchmark that's not up here that's for recreational water that's higher. It's a 32 per 100,000 cases, which is, is about 10 to the minus 3. And uh, many of our risk estimates are also below that line. So just a summary, at 500 feet downwind uh, from dairy manure irrigation, the illness risk is on the order of 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 100 per irrigation event. Now, again, there's a lot of, um, you know, for any specific situation, there's a lot of variability and uncertainty in those numbers, and there is a distance effect. So this isn't to say there's no distance effect, but this is just kind of a rough order of magnitude scale of the results. The risk depends on the pathogen type. The pathogen prevalence, so that's how, how common pathogens are from farm to farm, and on the distance you are downwind from the wetted perimeter. And pathogen concentrations downwind from manure irrigation depend on wind speed, the concentrations of manure and distance, uh, and it is unique for field data, and this is a long list of all the people that helped us get the work done. So.